Last week, those of you that were here, I, I preached a message on, bl on blueprints. And I talked about, I read out of Luke 24, and then I went, went into Acts 1 and 2. And I, I just shared uh, about when Jesus told the disciples and, and told uh, the believers to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise. And then they, we read in Acts 1, we find them going into Jerusalem, being obedient to the Lord's command. And they go into the upper room and they begin to tarry. They begin to not just hang around and wait, but they begin to pray. They begin to intercede. They begin to pull heaven to earth, knowing that the very thing that qualified their Savior was the thing that was about to rest upon them and launch them into the work. And launched them into the three and a half years of teaching that Jesus had not only taught them but demonstrated. And so I shared on that last week. And I shared about the kind of the characteristics of the New Testament church. Being a people of prayer and being bold witnesses. And, and, and several other things that I shared on last week. But as I left, as I left last Wednesday and going into Thursday. And I, was, I began to pray and seek the Lord. The Lord, and I, I begin to ask the Lord again, Father, how can I in my own life begin to look like this New Testament church that I read about in Acts, Lord? How, how can I, Father, begin to live like this, Lord, that when I, when I go into the community, when I walk into restaurants, Lord, when I'm around my friends and family, Lord, how can I demonstrate this? How can in every, every avenue of my life, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is being released and demonstrated in my life. And the Lord basically began to deal with me and began to give me this message tonight. So let's go hold that. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about in a minute. Let's go to Luke to John 21. And also we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 13. And that's going to be our text for tonight. John 21 and uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So we read about last week in Acts 1 and Acts 2, we find Peter comes out of the upper room and begins to boldly preach. We find the New Testament believers. We know some theologians uh, believe that it wasn't just Peter that was preaching that day, that there was many of them that was preaching with boldness. And then over 3,000 people were saved, not including women and children, were saved, were instantly brought into the kingdom. And at that moment, the New Testament church is formed. It's the beginning of the New Testament church at that instant. But what we, and we begin to look at Peter as the forerunner, as the front man in the first several chapters of Acts. We see the life of Peter. We see him in Acts chapter 3. Go to the gate called Beautiful and a lame man gets up and walk. We see him in Acts chapter 4. Uh, him and I believe it's Peter and John again. They're thrown into jail. For, for witnessing about Jesus, for proclaiming His goodness and His gospel. And He goes before the Sanhedrin Council and, and they, they, repr you know, they reprimand Him and, and, and they release Him. And then He instantly goes into His community and they begin to pray for boldness. And the very thing that got Him locked up, He's praying for more of it. And so we're reading about this Peter, and, and I'm looking at Peter, and I'm saying, you know, I want to be more like Peter, and, and I, want to, I want to be able to have that type of boldness. I want to begin to walk like Peter. I want to begin to demonstrate, Lord, your goodness like Peter. But there was also a Peter before the Peter that we read about in the book of Acts. And you see, the Peter that we're going to read about tonight, we're going to read about a, a Peter that was one way before and then a new Peter. And then we're going to find out tonight that there's a common denominator that got Peter from his old self into this bold witness that we find in the beginning of Acts 2. And I believe it is the same common denominator in our lives that is going to push us to be the community that God has called us here at Heart of the Father. I believe it is the very thing that is going to fuel us to live the life that the Lord has called us to live here. I am convinced and I believe, and I said it last week, and I probably say every time that I preach, that I know for a fact the heart of the Father has been giving a key to this city to unlock things that other people cannot unlock. It doesn't mean that other churches aren't relevant. It doesn't mean that we're not going to lock arms with other communities because we are. But I believe there's something very special about this body and what God is doing is He is getting us ready. He is preparing us. He is maturing us. He is as even Marie was teaching this morning in prayer that he is showing us our identity and he is teaching us to mature. The Lord has very tall and he's getting us ready to be able to handle the weight of the kingdom as it begins to rest upon our shoulder. But there's one common denominator that I want to talk about tonight. I want to entitle this message. I guess before I leave, I'll go ahead and tell you I cannot keep secrets very long. 
You'll find that out about with me if I get my wife a gift. I tell her before I even buy it. But the text of the, the, the uh, title of the sermon tonight is Love, the Breakfast of Champions. Amen. Love, the Breakfast of Champions. John chapter 21, I'm going to begin to read in verse 1. I'm going to read the entire chapter of 21 if that's okay. Yeah. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Everybody say nothing. So it's funny that right after Jesus is has been crucified and, 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 and they're, they're, they're defeated and they're beat down and they feel like everything is falling apart and we, we know that Jesus is beginning to show himself but the very thing, that the only thing that Peter really knew he has quickly returned to and Peter, Peter was such a follower that those around him began to even go back into the very thing that Peter was falling back into. But in verse 4 we find, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Verse 9. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have uh, just caught. Verse 11. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Verse 12, so Jesus said to them, come out, come and eat, uh, come and eat breakfast. Everybody say breakfast. breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because... He had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most, assur most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and will gird, and you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, this is Jesus, said to him, follow me. Bre uh, love the breakfast of champions. This is an awesome chapter here. We find, like I said a moment ago, that Peter, is, is we, we know that in Luke, I believe chapter 5, that this, there's a similar story here when, when Peter is fishing and Jesus originally calls Peter. It's, he, he, allowed, he causes Peter to catch a bunch of fish and then it says that Peter immediately began to follow Jesus. And then we know the story that for three and a half years, Peter begins to follow Jesus. And for three and a half years, Jesus begins to instill in Peter and the disciples the ways of the kingdom. He begins to talk about the ways of the kingdom. He begins to say things like, I only do what I see my father do. 
And he, and he begins to he begins to talk about miracles, and then he begins to demonstrate miracles, and he begins to talk about sin and repentance, and then he begins to demonstrate it, and he begins to, to tell them things about the ways of the kingdom, and he begins to have campfire visitations with them and midnight encounters with them, and he teaches them about prayer, and he teaches them about the ways of the kingdom. And so for three and a half years, here we have Jesus instilling into his disciples the ways of the kingdom and what would be necessary for them to expand the kingdom into the uttermost parts of the earth and begin to turn the world upside down. But we all know the story that Jesus goes through uh, as we, uh, the, the, once again, concentrating on the life of Peter. We know, we all know too well what happens to Peter. We know that Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the, his great, one of his greatest hours of trial right before he is about to be taken away and, and crucified on the cross. He is praying with such intensity that the capillaries in his, in his forehead begin to open and blood begins to come down. And, 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 and Peter, where's Peter at? He's asleep. As Jesus is praying. And then we know that this same story that guards come in to arrest Jesus. And this same Peter who was asleep jumps up, grabs a sword, half asleep and cuts off a guard's ear. And then we know that, that Jesus is taken away, that he's tried, he's, commended, I mean, he's committed to death, he's been hung on a cross. And we know that Peter is nowhere to be found. As a matter of fact, he's around a fire denying Jesus three times. And so the same Jesus, that for, or the same Peter for three and a half years that was following Jesus, that was seeing the ways of the kingdom, that when Jesus first encountered him and beckoned him to follow him, and this is my own opinion, I believe that Peter first followed him for the fame and the fortune that came with following Jesus. But little did Peter know what it would cost him to be a true disciple. But he would soon find out what it would really cost him. And listen, it's love that restores Peter back to his intent, to his, to, into his original intention and launches him into the apostle that we know today. And it's love, guys, that even when we make mistakes, even when we start out on a particular path and God has called us to do things and we stumble along the way and we make mistakes, that love, God comes in His corrective love, but He comes in love and He begins to pull on our hearts and He begins to pull us out of that life and back into the road that the Lord has intended us for. And, and when He does pull us back onto that road that the Lord has intended us for, He begins to set us back on course in the very course that He originally called us to do. I'm just here to challenge you tonight that what God has called you to do, what we see in the book of Acts, the, two, the New Testament church that we read about, what compelled them, what commissioned them, what engulfed them was love. And it is love is what will cause us to step into the very thing that the Lord has called us to, to walk in. How did Peter do what he did? How was his life so effective? How did the early church stay in unity, have common hearts, radical generosity, turn the world upside down? Guys, it was simply love. It was love. It was a love for Jesus because Jesus first loved them. And we find here in John chapter 21 that, that Peter had, has returned back to his old habits of fishing. Going back to what he only what he knew that he could do. At this point, he felt defeated. At this point, he knew that he had denied Jesus and that he had messed up. He had not had, I believe, a, a real revelation of the love of Jesus. He had not really fully gotten all of the teaching that Jesus had released into him. And so he thought, I've messed up. I've missed it. It's over with. There's no shock for me. Upon this rock, I will build my church. All of that is out the door. And so Peter says, I'm going to go back to the only thing that I know, and that's fishing. I'm going to take my buddies with me. And so he goes out into the boat. He begins to do the very thing that he knows. But guess what? Jesus shows up like he always does in his precious love. And he comes to compel Peter back to the very thing that he called him to do. He came to correct him, but he came to restore him that day. And I believe that Jesus is calling us and beckoning us tonight into Lakeland to do some very powerful things as a community. But I believe some of us oftentimes get hung up on what God's called us to do because of how we have failed or where we've messed up. And Jesus is here tonight in his love and in his mercy to say, come here. I want to show you things. Come here. I want to correct you. We want to work on things. We want, to, we want you to mature. We want to bring you into a greater place of maturity in your walk with the Lord. But it's love that will do it. It's love that will fuel it. Amen? Amen. Love is the breakfast of champions. 
We know that around this campfire that Jesus was preparing some fish and bread. But what he was really preparing on the menu that day was a huge serving of divine love. That captivated the heart of Peter and brought him back into his right intention. And launched him into a man who goes into the upper room and comes together with a community of people. And begins to pray until the Holy Spirit shows up. And when he does, they step out of that room today and Peter never looks back. And God uses him as a father of the New Testament church. And there's somebody in this room tonight that the Lord is compelling you back to say, I've called you, I've showed you things in the midnight hour. I'm challenging you tonight. And I'm here to show you tonight that I love you and I want to pour it out on you and I want to launch you into the very thing that I've whispered in the midnight hour to you. A little girl was invited for dinner at her home of her first grade friend. On the menu that night, the vegetable was buttered broccoli. I mean, like broccoli. Yeah. It's good for you, actually. <laughs> and the mother asked if she liked it. The child said, oh, yes, politely, I love it. But when the bowl of broccoli was passed, she declined to take any. The mother said, I thought you said you loved broccoli. The girl replied sweetly, oh, yes, ma'am, I do, but not enough to eat it. <laughs> Do you love your family? Of course we do. We all would say that. Do we love Jesus? Of course we do. We would all say that. But what do we mean by love? So often we love our family like that little girl loved broccoli. So many times we love the Lord like that little girl loved broccoli. We love in the abstract, but when it comes right down to it, we don't want to get close. In the words of the Apostle John, we love in word, but not in deed and truth. Peter at one point was like this little girl. But as we will see over breakfast and over an encounter with Jesus, his eyes are open to a love that leads him into the call from Christ. See, the Lord has me on a journey, as I said earlier, even in this message, as God has, uh, has been speaking to me about this particular message. And as I'm wrestling in my own walk with the Lord, as I'm maturing in the Lord, as God has got me on a mission, as the Lord has... Is, is pulling things out of me as the Lord is working on me and pouring things out of me and stretching me and, and as, as the Lord comes to correct me and he all, he all does it in love but he began to show me that all the things that he has placed in my heart to achieve and to do for him that he placed in my heart can only be accomplished out of a place of love. If we do not do those, we end up like this girl. We just seem to say we love it, but we really don't. When, when it gets close, we want to back away from it. When, it. when the rubber meets the road and when we're really challenged, like Peter. Peter told Jesus when Jesus first called him, yes, I'll go, Lord. But when the greatest hour of trial came, Peter quickly fell into the shadows and said, Lord, I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. But you know what? The Lord is in His goodness comes and restores Him. And I believe tonight wants to restore us. I hope tonight you understand that I'm preaching to myself and I just hope that someone's listening. Yeah. Jesus is eager here in John 21 to fellowship with His disciples. And for breakfast, it is love that He serves that changes a man. It's just so, to me, this is such a compelling and an awesome story that we see this, this, this apostle who, who God uses in such a powerful way. That, and we find that when the Lord originally calls him, you know, and you begin to read about Peter. And we know this is the same Peter who spoke up and said, you're the Christ. And this is, you know, the same Peter who seemed to always, you know, he's the first one that jumps out of the boat. And he's the first one that makes it into the tomb. And, you know, we can't deny the, the zealous heart and passion that Peter Peter has. But this is the same Peter who, when, when, when the hour of trial came, he quickly denied the Lord. But it's just so awesome that this is such a story of, of transformation. And this is such a powerful story where we see that love that is released into this, man, this man's life reconciles him back to everything that the Lord placed into his heart. See, the primary mark of the redeemed has always been love for God. The great Old Testament confession of faith declares this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. I want to read a few quotes to you on love tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. I'll read a few quotes to you. To love someone means to see him as God intended him. Being loved 
is life's second greatest blessing. Loving is the greatest. Love is the doorway through which the human soul passes from selfishness to service. Everything God does is love, even when we do not understand Him. In the New Testament, love is more of a verb than a noun. It has more to do with acting than with feeling. The call to love is not so much a call to a certain state of feeling as it is to a quality of action. The world does not understand theology or dogma, but it understands love and sympathy. I cannot love you as I love myself until I love God as I ought to love Him. Augustine, what does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has the ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. And the last one, the world is not a playground. It is a schoolroom. Life is not a holiday, but an education. And the one eternal lesson for us all is how better we can love. How better we can love. Once again, the primary mark of the redeemed has always been love for God. The theme of loving God was always on the heart of David who wrote in Psalm 18.1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The New Testament also teaches that love is the mark of a true believer. When asked to name the greatest commandment of the law, Jesus replied, You shall love the Lord with, with your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew 22.37 We also, uh, only those who love God receive eternal life and inherit the kingdom. You see, our love towards God is what solidifies our place in the kingdom of God. It's love that allows us to receive our inheritance into the kingdom. And then Peter, who we are talking about tonight, wrote in his first epistle, Though you not see him talking about Christ, you love him. See, tonight, even though we can't see the Lord with our eyes, it's love that causes us to follow him tonight with passion. It's love that will cause us to get up tomorrow morning and continue to follow Him. It's love that compels us to come here at 6 a.m. in the morning on Wednesdays and Mondays and pray together. It's love that compels us to go out into the community and we see people broken and hurting and we begin to share the gospel with them. It's love that brings unity. It's love that floods out offense. It's love that floods out hurt. It's love that says, I prefer my brother over myself. It's love that allows us to receive the call as a disciple. Peter learned the hard way what it means to love Jesus. He had declared his unfailing devotion to him more than once. At the Last Supper, Simon Peter told Jesus, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow. And Peter said, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. But yet, we know that at the greatest hour... Peter goes to chew on those words as he denies the Lord. Yet when the chips were down, Peter, self-confessed love, failed and he openly denied three times that he knew Jesus. His vaunted courage proved to be nothing but empty talk when facing a threatening situation. But we know Jesus came. Even in that, we know that the Lord came in John 21 and over an open fire invites him into a place of fellowship and restores him back. Love is the breakfast of champions. Love is what caused the Apostle Peter to be a champion of the New Testament church. That love is what allowed the, the, some of the great revivalists of the old that we, re, that we read about from California to Kentucky where we see children in Kentucky that used to get on the back of horses and preach about Jesus and Him crucified and grown men would fall under the power of God in repentance and, it made, and young girls and young boys would begin to weep under the, the power of God Almighty as they would compel sinners to come into the revelation of Jesus Christ and it was love that caused them to compel Hell. It was love that engulfed them, guys, and it's love tonight that will push us into this, into this life of love with Jesus. It's love, guys, that will cause us to overcome the hardships, the trials, the temptations, the everyday mundane of life that when we want to give up and we want to say, I can't do this anymore. It's too hard, but it's love that will fuel us. Amen? 
See, Jesus knew that if Peter was going to play a crucial role in the early church that he had chosen him for, he was going to restore him back around his fellow companions that day. See, Jesus came, and when, he, and when Jesus begins to talk to Peter, and he begins to tell him, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know that I love you, Lord. And we know that when Jesus is saying that to Peter, he's using the agape form of love, the divine. And Peter responds back in a less than divine love, in a more of a phileo love, a brotherly love, out of the conviction of his heart, knowing that his heart was gripped with conviction. But the Lord in this place, even though he's bringing correction to him, at the same time he's bringing restoration and he's restoring him right in front of his brothers. Even in the midst of correction, he's restoring him right in the midst of his brothers. There, How wonderful is the Lord, that even when He brings correction to us, even when He's pulling things out of us and He's rebuking us, that He's even restoring us and preparing us to grow into a greater place of maturity, to walk in a greater place of maturity, to handle more than we've ever been able to handle before, to pray more than we've ever been able to pray before, to testify of His goodness more than we've ever been able to testify. And I believe it's the key tonight. Love is the ingredient that's going to lift depression. Love is the ingredient that's going to leave, lift the fence. Love is the ingredient that's going to cause us to become united like never before. As the hour grows and the days seem to get darker, it's love that will bring us together. It's love that will be the flame that provides the light in the darkest hour. It's love of our heart for Jesus because He first loved us. See, it's our love for Jesus because He gave Himself as a ransom for us. He came and He gave His life as a ransom hung before men and gave his, he, he, he wrapped himself in flesh and endured what he had to endure here with, for the hope that was set before him for us. He did it for us because he loves us so much. And tonight it is what compels us to follow him. Amen. As soon as he had finished breakfast, we find that Peter, that the Lord begins to restore Peter by confronting him. I went in and I began to tell you about how Jesus invite, and asked him, do you love me? And Peter responds back saying, you know that I love you. And we know that the types of loves there that Jesus was talking about, a divine love. But the very last one, it switched around. Here, the very last time that, that Jesus asked him, it is switched around. And Jesus asked him in a brotherly love type of way. In one translation, one theologian shows it that Peter then, finally, the lights came on. The revelation came on. And he says, you know that I love you, Lord. And there was this divine love that began to flood his heart. And things began to finally open up and break. And, and Peter began to finally lean into what God was going to call him to do. I mean, he's excited about love. To accepting Peter's humble acknowledgement that his love was less than he had claimed that Christ deserved, Jesus still recommissioned him graciously, saying to him, Tend my lambs. See, tend translate a poor, and I'm just teaching a little bit, so I'm getting a little nervy, I'm sorry. I just want to just re release this real quick to us, because we're all called to tend, right? We're all called to tend lambs in some way, shape, or form. We're all called to disciple and to raise people up. The word tend here translates a form of a verb, a term used of a herdsman pasturing and feeding their livestock. The present tense of this verb denotes a continual action. In keeping with this metaphor, he introduces this. Jesus described believers as his lambs, and he's telling Peter it's the love. You've got to have a love for me and a love for people so that you can continually begin to nurture and continually begin to feed my lambs and continually begin to pour into my people for the for what I've called you to be, to be an apostle to the Jews, to pastor the people that I'm putting before you, to disciple this next generation that's coming up. It's love that is going to allow you to continually do that, even in adversity, even in trial, even when they're wanting to throw you in jail, even when they're, they're wanting to, 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 to lock you away and threaten you with death. Even in that, it's love that will compel you to continue to feed them, to love on them, That's good. and to pour into them. See, Peter remained obedient to the Lord's commission for the rest of his life. We know that after this encounter, after Jesus comes and he restores him in this 
this, this encounter of this fellowship, this, in, this invitation from the Lord for Peter to be restored. And on the menu that day was love. We know that we, know that, that, that we, we read about the fish and we concentrate on the fish and the bread, but really what was on the menu was love that day. And we know that what championed Peter to live the life that God called him to live was love that day. So what is love? Let's talk about that for a minute. What is love? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. This is a, an amazing chapter from Paul the Apostle on love. Verse 1, I'm going to read verse, it's only 13 verses and I'm going to try to hurry tonight. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Mm. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to the burn, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in, the, in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Here we have Paul sharing with the church of Corinth the most important virtue of a Christ follower. Uh, here, there are several words used to describe this love, but Paul uses the one that is rare in the Greek. It's the word I just used a moment ago, agape. And it suggests that it's a deliberate choice of the one who loves rather than the worthiness of the one being loved. So here we have uh, in, in, in chapter 12, we have Paul teaching about spiritual gifts. And then in 14, we have Paul teaching about prophecy. And sandwiched in between the two is this, is this chapter on love. And Paul is explaining to the Corinthians that you can have spiritual gifts. You know, you can raise the dead. You can prophesy. You can lay hands on the sick. You can preach the gospel all day long. But if you don't have love, it means nothing. You're just a clanging symbol. You're just going through the motions. But it's love that will endure because prophecy one day will be done away with. All of this of this world will be done away with. But one thing that will always remain is love. Love will remain. And love is the greatest of these three. And so he's literally uh, bringing correction to the church of Corinth because they're desiring spiritual gifts and they're desiring to prophesy. And all these things, Paul is saying, you need these things. You need spiritual gifts. You need to desire these things. You need to want to prophesy. But, but what's going to allow you to do it with the right heart? What's going to allow you to continue to do it year after year, month after month? What's going to allow you to do it with the Christ-like heart is love. Love is what's going to do that. Love is what is going. I, I have a story here that I want to read to you quickly. Um, it's from a lady in China. And from 1972, there was a two-year-old Chinese boy named Hu Jin. He fell from a table and went into a coma. When he woke up after six days, he was not able to talk or move. Like any parent, his mother uh, was terribly distressed. Yet her distress was multiplied by the fact she could not afford to place him in a nursing home or care. Instead, she has cared for her son herself, and her care has shown the unfathomable depth of her love for him. You see, because he is unable to move, Hu Jin is liable to get terrible bed sores. So for the past 30 years, his mother has done the unbelievable. She has carried her son on her back. And as of May of 2002, her son, weighing 180 pounds, was carried by his mom, weighing 100 pounds. Her son, now a grown man, 
On many occasions, Lou has fallen and fractured bones by carrying her son, yet she continues to carry him. And when asked how she can do it, her simple reply, he ain't heavy, he's my son. <laughs> he ain't heavy, he's my son. You see, what allowed this mother to carry a son twice her size to fall and even endure broken bones to fall and to, to hurt herself and the ridicule that came with that, well, with that was a love inside of her. And how much more is the love that we have inside of us, the love of Jesus, the love of Christ that penetrates our heart, the love of the Lord that compels us out of a life of sin, it compels us out of that life of darkness into the marvelous light. How much more can we do it when we have the love of Christ? It is clear that in 1 Corinthians 13, it's got to be studied in the context of the rest of Paul's letter to the church and that he is addressing the local church when he's reading, John, uh, when he's reading uh, writing the 13th chapter here of Corinthians. So it's important that we understand when we read chapter 13, when you go back and read it later on, that it's Paul talking to the local church and he's compelling them to be a people of love. And I'm just going to give you quickly, and we'll close, uh, a few things of what love is. Is that okay? So this is what love is. True love is patient. Number one, it's, I'm going to give you seven things of what love is. True love is patient. To be of a long spirit and not to lose heart. Patience means to be long-suffering, slow to anger, slow to punish. Patient with those who need to grow. Patient with imperfections of others. Patient when mistakes are made. That's what love does. Love creates in us a long-suffering that we're slow to anger, we're slow to punish. Number two, true kind of love is true love is kind. Mm. To be kind, to use kindness. This is the Greek word. True love is kind. To be kind, to use kindness. Kindness means carrying out acts that demonstrate loving kindness. First uh, John three eighteen. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we know that love is kind. Love seeks ways to demonstrate itself. See, love within us, we, when we have the true love of Christ, we want to seek ways to demonstrate our love through generosity, through telling people about the gospel, through sharing our testimony, how God stepped in and how he, he filled our dark world with light, how he pulled us out of the miry clay and set our feet upon a rock, how he touched us and how he healed us, how he restored us, how if, if we have family members that were maybe sick in their body and the Lord healed them, see, love compels us to want to share those things because love is kind. True love defends. It means to protect or keep by covering, to, to preserve, to cover up with silence. It doesn't mean that you do not confront, but it means you do not attack. It doesn't mean that you can't confront and correct, but it means you do not attack. True love defends. It stops hatred. It stops strife. But love covers a multitude of sins. The next one, true love believes and commits. True love believes. That's why we find it in of 1 Corinthians 13, that there's faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, because attached to love is faith and hope. So it encompasses, love encompasses faith and hope, and so that we know that love produces faith. So true love believes. This word believe means a type of belief that makes you committed. So when we have a true Christ-like encounter, see, when Peter on that shore that day and, and Jesus restores him and through this process of love, when he feeds him this breakfast of champions of love that day, what he's really doing into him is he's instilling him the ability to be committed to the cause. He's instilling him the ability to persevere. To, he's instilling him knowing. He even tells him that one day your arms are going to be stretched out in the same way that I died, except when we know that Peter was crucified upside down. You're going to go through the very thing that I went through in a very similar way. But what's going to allow you to endure to that day is love like this that causes you to believe, that causes you to stay committed, mm -hmm. that causes you to produce in you a strong commitment. Mm -hmm. Like that of the apostles of old who were committed to Christ even to the point of being martyred. And true love, trust. Love causes us to trust a hope in us 
You see, we know we, because of the love that is inside of us, because of the love that Christ has shown to us, it creates in us a trust. And so as a result of that, we have a hope in us. There's a hope of a future glory. There's a hope knowing that the promises of the word of God for us are yes and amen. And even in the greatest hour of temptation, even in the greatest hour of trial, even when our marriages seem like problems, even when we're sick in our body, even when things around us seem to be crumbling, that we can have hope because of love. Love allows us to walk in this place of hope. And trust means assuming the best about someone, not the worst. Hebrews 5, 9 says, Believe, be Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. And the last one, true, or there's two more. True love perseveres. True love creates in us the ability to endure, to persevere, even under misfortunes and trials. Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with the eternal glory. You see, uh, 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 Barry did such a great job of teaching on maturity a couple weeks ago. And in the essence of what he was saying is that the reason why Paul was able to admonish day and night, night and day, the reason why Paul was able to write things from a Philippian jail, the way he wrote things, is because he had a revelation of the love of Jesus in his life. The reason why he sat, he sought out every day to admonish the saints that he was connected to and to disciple them and to pour into them and to endure hardships like a good soldier is because he had a love of Jesus that radiated through his life. And it's that same love that Peter encountered that day. And we know that that's why we're able to read about the Peter that we read about in the first couple of chapters of Acts because of that encounter on that shore that day. And the last one is a true love endures. It means to abide, to dwell, to be present, to remain, to stand, or to tarry. In Genesis 29, 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. You see, love allows us to tarry and remain in our marriages. This type of love allows us to continue to love our children, the poor and our... This type of love allows us to continue to love our brothers and sisters who we're in community with. We'll continue to walk this walk out with each other. Listen, we're going to make mistakes. There's things that we're going to do to each other that hurt each other. But, you know, it's the love of the Lord that covers those, that removes us as we grow and we mature. But it's love that keeps us united and connected. It's love that is going to allow us to finish this thing that the Lord has started here in this work of this house. As we begin to see God explode and unfold things in the coming days. Amen? Amen. Excited about that? Yeah. Let's stand.